start sir it gives us immense pleasure to welcome dr helena williams founder and ceo gastro gatherings usa an international business based in the usa providing consulting services to individual gastro tourism sites helping gastro clusters formation and assisting with broader sustainable geographic destination development she is a passionate and prolific researcher in the area of sustainable gastro tourism and gastro destination development her research findings have been published in top academic journals and have been presented internationally Dr. Williams is a visiting research scholar at Craxton University, Potsdam, New York. She holds a PhD in Hospitality Administration, Administration from Texas Tech University and a master's degree in Community Psychology from the Pennsylvania State University. She also earned a certificate in cuisine from Lee Cordon Bleu and worked as the executive chef in Baltimore, Maryland, first gastro cafe. Now I would like to request ma'am to please proceed with your session. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Over to you. Hello. It's a real pleasure for me to be here. I'm going to try to upload my PowerPoint now. Right. And here we go. Okay, we're going to turn it into. Yes, ma'am, it is visible. I'm going to get my. And please uh, make a slide share. Yes, I'm trying to do that. Oh, okay. I'm just clicking from beginning. Yeah. Okay, do it. I'm from beginning. I'm I'm trying. Yeah, it's done, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, it's done. Okay, here we are. Okay. So hello. Um. I am Helena Williams, and I'm very excited to be here today. To talk to you about gastrotourism, really one of my favorite subjects to research, to study about, and to explore myself. As as you, you were giving, given such a nice introduction of me, I will briefly tell you that I am a researcher, a teacher, I'm a chef, and I'm the director of gastro gatherings. And I'm also an enthusiastic gastro tourist myself. So all of these passions came together in order for me to be able to research in this area. So what are what the talk today is going to be about is really three separate three separate um, little talks. The first one is what exactly is I'm sorry, this, it keeps flipping this. I'm going to move a few things around because this technology is getting in my way. OK, here we go. So the, the talk today has three parts. What exactly is gastrotourism? And then we're going to take a little break and talk about post-pandemic implications in today's world regarding gastrotourism and gastrotourism development. And then we're going to end the presentation talk on really looking at what are some of the steps that go into sustainable gastronomic, really destination development in a region. Okay, so part one, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about my research, how experiential tourism relates. We'll talk more about local food and drink, who are gastro tourists, and who are all the stakeholders we need to be concerned about. So what my research originally set out to do, and I've been researching this topic now for about for four or five years, I wanted to look at the broad constructs and any little sub elements that are linked to gastrotourism so that I could better define the entire gastrotourism phenomenon. And so here's just a little bit of theoretical work for all you researchers who may be there. Um, all of my research was grounded in stakeholder theory, really looking at anyone that's affected by or affects the gastro tourism destination development process that would be a stakeholder and then i also thought it was really important to look at 
the economic development aspects of gastrotourism. And so um, I really looked at economic multiplier effects um, from schools of economics. And I really looked at expanding um, wealth in an area, but also looking at improving living standards. And so really the, um, the larger multiplying effect of any kind of tourism establishment or initiative begins at the top, right, where we're looking at who the tourists are and what they pay directly to these, these tourism entities, but then all these other um, places in your community also benefit from um, tourism application, especially gastrotourism. So, Taking everything I was studying, I tried to bring together all of the topics and all of the information to come up with a definition of gastrotourism. And the best I was able to do that I felt most comfortable with is that is the intentional pursuit of authentic, memorable culinary experiences of all kinds while traveling globally, regionally, and especially in this day and age, even locally. And, and that's a definition that really the field had come up with back in 2014. So this local aspect to gastrotourism is critical now during um, pandemic implications, and we'll talk about that later, but it also helps to describe just who these tourists are. Okay, so gastrotourism really is, is I think the one thing I want you to start thinking about early in this presentation is that it's more than just eating and drinking during meals, even when we travel. It's really about what we eat, how we eat it. Everyone does that differently. It's about where and when we eat. It's about why we eat. And Probably the most important for gastrotourism implications is it's the recognition that local foods, regional foods, and culinary practices really are the things that build the kitchen cultures that people want to visit and explore, that, that I say in this slide, that are ripe for discovery. So it's more than just eating out when we travel, very important. It's really about experiencing, right? So what are some examples of gastrotourism? Well, cooking classes and festivals and foraging expeditions and market tours and winery and distillery tours and special chef tables or learning to cook in someone's home, tastings, anything that helps you to immerse into um, the food of a local area. So where does gastrotourism fit within the whole travel industry world? Well, it's a specialized tourism subset that looks for travelers who intentionally seek these memorable, authentic food and beverage experiences. But it's also a critical component within other types of experiential tourism. So I mentioned experiential tourism, right? What exactly is that? Well, experiential tourism is kind of a global learning movement, if you, if you could say so, where people seek personalized meaning through their travel experiences. It involves active participation and real immersion um, and some level of co-creating the activity or the experience with the host. It's, it's not at all passive. The ideal experiential travel really maintain environmental sensitivity and they display a huge respect for the culture of the host area. Again, it's not just about eating the food. It's about wanting to understand what this food means. So what might be a goal of experiential tourism? Well, the desired outcome is to really 
have a complete participatory experience that teaches you something new and you walk away feeling that something was very authentic. It's a quality experience shared between you, the other guests, the host, and the staff. It, ex it, <laughs> it includes the people you meet, the places you visit, the activities you participate in, and most of all, the memories that you create. So experiential tourism actually is a merging of personal interests into rich, immersive moments. Your passions, your interests, your hobbies, your idiosyncrasies draw you to want to go to a place to experience something that will be ultimately memorable and meaningful to you. Authentic, memorable food and beverage activities are usually found within all kinds of experiential um, travel. So um, let's take a look. Here's an, all of these pictures that will be coming forward are actual examples of photographs from travel related um, advertisements asking people to check out what they are offering. And so this was one on cultural tourism. And you can see the references there on the right side. But take a look at all of these photos and you can see that in cultural tourism, it looks to me like they're eating food and sharing food together and they're very happy about doing it, right? And here's nature tourism. Again, there's some sharing of food in some bizarre situations, right? Okay. And ecotourism. Again, you're out in the wild and not only sharing your food, but looking at how you need to be taking care of the environment and disposing of your food prop of your food um, waste properly. Um, this is an example of an experience, experimental township that I found um, right here in India. And one of the things they list is organic farming. And so I'm sure there are some food tastings and some gastrotourism happening there. Adventure tourism. Um, the middle uh, photograph um, with the woman working with some food ingredients um, was very interesting to me because this was an actual advertisement for an adventure experience, but they already combined food. Taste the adventure, explore the intersection of food experiences and adventure travel. Like I said, um, it's all connected to gastrotourism. Agritourism is very close to gastrotourism, but it's going out to farms and um, more rural areas and working with the land and the food and the people and the animals. And then a, a kind of um, more niche uh, experiential tourism is wine or beverage tourism, visiting wineries and vineyards and breweries and even distilleries. And then um, all that leads to gastrotourism, gastronomic tourism. Either people want to do it deliberately or they're doing it while they're experiencing other things, but pretty much it's all about the food. Local food really is the symbol of a destination. So let's, let's look at this photograph. And I don't know if we can have some participation here um, with, with people in the audience, Vandita, but um, would, would everybody say, what would people say looking at this food? What country or where does it represent? I think the participants can uh, write their uh, replies in the chat box. Yes. Well, um, yeah. it's pretty. It, to me, it's pretty obvious. It looks like Indian food, wouldn't you say? I'm nodding yes. my head. I hope you're uh, nodding your head. I can't see you all, but hopefully, um, the dishes, the colors, the the little silver, um, all of that reminds me of when I was in India a few years ago. It, it just is is very um, symbolic of that country and the food. So here's um, 
I'm going to show you a few other examples and let's see what you might think. Okay. So here we have uh, some pictures of pineapples. Well, for people in the US, when we think of pineapples, um, we think of one particular state in the United States, but you might be thinking of other areas. But as a US traveler, I was thinking Hawaii. Whenever I see pineapples, there's such a close connection to the pineapple and Hawaii tourism that whenever you see that, my mind automatically connects the food to the place, right? Uh, ah, here are some other dishes, right? They're kind of interesting, colorful, right? And here also some beverages are added because gastrotourism is about the food and the drink. So here in the left is a little hot citron um, tea drink and there's some suju at the top and uh, a little barley tea. So were you thinking Korea? Maybe Korean food? The food really is the place, right? And so here, this one might be a little harder because you're seeing this luscious chocolate and then you're seeing some chocolate bars for eating, but you're also seeing the actual cocoa pods and the way cocoa looks. And so you might be thinking, well, it, it can't be Belgium because they're not actually growing the pods in Belgium, but where can I get good chocolate and experience it naturally, maybe go on a chocolate tour. Well, these are all pictures I took when I was in Costa Rica. I had been doing some work there on destination development and they have a very strong um, coffee industry, but they also have a very strong chocolate industry. And so we're working with people in Costa Rica, I am, to help them create strong attachments between food and their destination. Okay. So, huh, here's that picture of that food I showed earlier, right? The food that we said was Indian. But really in India, right, there are so many different regions and the food that's available really is a lot more regional, right? That food was actually from the Andhra Pradesh. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but in this particular breakout of culinary foods in India, there were one, two, three, four, five different regions, right? And the Andhra Pradesh is down in the south, right? This gentleman created a different way of looking at Indian cuisine. I believe he's also a Harvard professor and he identified six famous regional cuisines, right? And so the thing that's interesting about that is when I was in India, I found that if I went even, even 20 minutes away, it might be the same food, but it tasted differently. The spices and the way it was created was just subtly or drastically different. So I wanted to go all over India. And here in this, in this picture, um, I actually learned about idli um, when I was in graduate school a few years ago and my friend Harsh took me to this um, little um, Indian restaurant in the United States and the menu was not in English and he introduced me to various types of food and I loved this soft fluffy idli and, he, and, and the, the sambar spicy soup and then I learned that it, it Idli itself can be done lots of different ways in lots of different places. So there could be some gastro tourists who want to come to India just to taste these various variations of idli and what you eat it with. Do you eat it with chutney? Do you eat it with soup? Right. And here is is a to me a, a wonderful picture of an expert in Idli production <laughs> and she's happy to share that. And so it's really important that regional differences in identical foods um, are the thing that makes gastro touring an endless journey. And here I found this wonderful 
photograph, picture of all the foods you should eat whenever you go to India from all of the regions. And I know this is just a very short list, but yet when I look at it, I'm, I'm hungry and wanting to have these experiences. Because gastro tourists travel to learn about new cultures by experiencing local foods and drinks with a variety of local hosts, not just one or two, right? All right. So who are these gastro tourists? Well, I've already admitted to being one, um, but really my research told me that gastro tourism is on the rise and it crosses all ages and genders and economic levels. So you can see all the generations, but it was really baby boomers who led the way. And if, if this um, man to the right is familiar, that's, the famous, really probably pioneer in gastro tourism, the late Anthony Bourdain, right? And he, he, he said, sleep on the floor if you have to. Find out how other people live and eat and cook and learn from them wherever you go. And so baby boomers wanted to start doing this. Then the Gen Xers came along. They actually grew up with the, the food, um, the term foodie, it was first used in 1980. They were our first food and travel bloggers. They were very serious about food and, tr and traveling. And really, they told the world that when they travel, they want, to, they want food they can't get back at home. And they also want to learn how to cook it. They wanted to be immersed. And then came our millennials, right? 50% of millennials self-identify as foodies and 52 say they would rather attend a food festival than a music festival. And 78 spend discretionary money on memorable food experiences over purchased items. It's all very fascinating that um, millennials cherish these experiences more than things. And then the new Gen Z gastro tourists, they were just born after 1985. So maybe, maybe the tourists right now might be around 25 and they're really um, looking at travel as a priority, right? And um, technology is very important. Seeing the world is, is very important. 94% research where they're going to eat even before they travel. So what did I learn in my own research about gastro tourists? Well, they travel more often, they stay longer, they spend more money when they travel, they create more EWOM word of mouth, they post more on social media, and really important in my research, I found that if there are six or more foodie experiences collected within a two hour travel radius, they will come to that destination, not for the geography of it, but for those six experiences, and they will stay overnight, which goes back to the multiplier effect. You have tourists coming and staying in a region or an area for more than just a quick pass through. So they're spending their money and it's spreading out to um, the petrol companies and every, every other little shop um, that they may encounter. There were few significant generational differences. Surprisingly, I thought there would be big differences between millennials and baby boomers, but the data did not prove that to be so. There were very small, significant differences between millennials who like to travel in larger groups, six to 10, whereas baby boomers and Gen Xers traveled in groups of couples or two or four people. And millennials spent slightly more money during their deliberate trips. Interesting. So what is the road to becoming a gastro tourist? Well, any traveler can be a gastro tourist once in a while, right? Anyone can do that. Few start out being gastro tourists all the time. 
50% of foodies, uh, well, 50% of the population tend to be foodies, and they've been faster towards either deliberately or accidentally. So I bring up these definitions, and you'll see this is the first time I wrote something in red because it's very important, right? Because the distinction between deliberately planning a trip and incidentally going on a trip because you're in an area for some other reason has significant marketing ramifications. And we'll talk about that later, but I, I wanted to bring it up right away so we start thinking about this difference, right? More of gastro adventures have become, when, when more gastro adventures become their most memorable travel experience, they begin to tell their friends about it. This is really the trigger, the turning point, right? And once they experience authentic tourist adventures, most seek more and ever increasing ones as their primary leisure travel activity. So once you get them hooked, once they decide this is what they want to do, um, they don't go back, right? So um, if we were doing an interactive class, I would ask you um, to talk about this, but for now, just think about it. What's your most memorable travel experience? or one of them. Just think for a moment. Does it involve food or drink? Okay. Chances are a, a number of you will say yes. So um, let's look at this. Are you a foodie or a food enthusiast? So this is the definition I used in my research when I was asking, um, asking this question, right? So one definition of the term foodie refers to people who enjoy and appreciate food a lot and also enjoy the cooking process, even if they don't cook themselves. To them, eating is more important than just nourishment. They appreciate and want to learn and talk about the ingredients, go on and on and on, right? So using this definition, raise your hand, and I won't be able to see you, but raise your hand if you're a foodie, right? And the same for gastro tourism, right? Are you a gastro tourist, right? Someone who deliberately travels internationally, regionally, or even locally to experience authentic cuisine, right? Have you ever been a gastro tourist? Raise your hand, raise your hand. I admitted to being one early. And so if you're a foodie or if you're a gastro tourist, um, I, I generally, in my sessions, pass out little bookmarks so people could take home and really show their friends. But here in a virtual world, it's a little difficult, but maybe I can send them to you. Okay. And again, I'm going to repeat this, that gastro tourists are both deliberate and incidental. Very important to understand that you could deliberately plan a trip, you can spend weeks and days and, and, and many, many um, online searches to deliberately plan the perfect trip. But then you might be on a business trip or going somewhere for medical procedures or to visit family and friends. And because you're a foodie, because you're a gastro tourist, you will look for these incidental gastro experiences. And what I want to point out is on trips where gastro tourists reported spending the most money, right? over 40% over were incidental travelers, okay, 40%, okay. So why are they the first to often find a new destination? They're destination influencers. Well, because they seek food adventures, not places. They're not looking necessarily to go to um, New Mexico, but they're looking to experience hot chili peppers and the other food things that that state has available. They bring their friends, they engage in EWOM, social media, they blog, they take photographs, they are influential. Okay, 
So who are these stakeholders, right? Tourists and also local loyals who seek gastro experiences, right? The owners and managers are also of these gastro businesses, as well as developers who are interested in tourism destinations are the three key primary stakeholders. And what do gastro tourists tell us? When, when we synthesize all the information and research, they say, if the planning was easier, we would travel more often, right? Factors that frustrate tourists while they're planning, no phone, problems booking, suggestions for easier planning. Well, they want assistance from professionals, better communication, better technology. I'm actually, through my gastro gatherings company, working on an app to actually meet some of these needs. It's right now in a stage where we're just collecting information. So if you're interested, if you think you're a gastro tourist, you should check us out. The other suggestions for easier planning are accurate pricing, clear authenticity promises, safety assurances, and reliable transportation. And what have the gastro hosts told us? Well, they said to thrive, they need a core group of local loyal people, and they need to be 40 to 50% of their business, but they also need a steady stream of outside tourists, about 50 to 60%, or their business won't make it. So jot down those average percentages because a little later we'll be talking about them. All right. And then developers, what do they value most? Well, it boosts local economy, creates jobs, elevates living. And so in order to look at this, we came up with indicators that actually um, can can help an area who's interested in economic development and quality of life improvements through tourism to be on the right track, right? By before you even initiate um, a, a program, a gastro tourism development program, you start doing some baseline um, numbers. Okay. So in summary, what they, do they need? What do they want? Right? Easy to find activities, steady flow of tourists, economic development, authentic experiences, cost sharing, recognition and prestige, reducing food waste, trustworthy hosts, higher revenue and profits. Right? Good summary. And remember that it's tourists as well as your local loyals who will be these gastro tourists. All right. So we have a primary stakeholder network, right, that actually looks at the customers and your visitors, also takes into account your employees, and it looks like your gastro competitors. And those competitors are the people you would want to go to if you're creating a destination in your region. Those six that could group together and make your one little um, entity, your micro gastro destination, bigger in comparison, right? You're going to look to your vendors for support. You're going to look for other tourism attractions. So this is a model that was... Um, really put together after hundreds of interviews with gastro destinations talking about who their stakeholders are. And then there are also secondary stakeholders that include your restaurants and, and um, convention centers and banks and transportation and hotels. And I'm gonna flip through this quickly because the most important thing to do is to create a working stakeholder model that's specific to your location. So you're looking at your local loyals, your local governments, the names of your staff, your incidental tourists, your delivered tourists, your vendors, your gastro competitors, and you create this model of the gastro destination in your local area. Okay. All right, now we're at part two of the presentation and I'm just gonna kind of hurry along through this part so we can get to the end. So you'll see 
that I thought a lot and I reached out to colleagues to talk about post-pandemic implications that are specific to um, gastrotourism. So first of all, there are four major international tourism trends that were trends prior to the pandemic, right? Seeking experiences, personalization, digitalization, and implications over over tourism. The post-COVID implications really um, kind of jumpstart now with new overarching implications around health and safety. So we're still interested in seeking these experiences, but safety, seeking safe experiences has become critical. Personalization is still a very heavy desire. And down in digitalization, it's no longer high touch and high tech, it's no touch and high tech. And over tourism right now is no longer a problem, right? So um, I then thought about what are some things that gastro hosts have valued and performed every day, you know, multiple times, um, even during this critical pandemic um, preventive um, period, before and after it. And so um, the first thing is that this preventative health has always been a foundation of the food and beverage tourism industry, right? We wash hands, wipe surfaces, change gloves, wear masks hundreds of times a day, right? We're way ahead of the rest of the world. Plexiglass sneeze guards, right, are not new to food and beverage industry people, right? Gastro businesses, I think, are in a position to teach the world how to decide and use them. And automation that reduces elimination in human touch minimal or no human touches used for decades since the 70s um, in packaged products, right? It's not new. Food factory tours are all conducted behind glass or in specialized design showrooms, often with videos and audios, right? And this little guy over here, Moto Man, right? He's already um, cooking omelets and serving them to people with no human help. So the food and beverage industry gets it, right? They know. So then I looked at, well, what are some eight pandemic inspired ideas that gastro hosts can really quickly embrace or have quickly embraced and probably enhanced upon? So I'm going to start with something that may seem trivial, but is very important, right? Mega buffets. They've always been risky business, right? And anything where a lot of people have to touch something like mini bars and eating with your hands around other people, right? It just seems we're never a good idea. So the pandemic has taught us that this double dipping and poorly positioned sneeze guards and multiple fingers touching our food can now really be deadly. <laughs> Enough said. Um, again, mini bars, hotels are removing non-essential items handled by persons unknown. Mini bars are being taken away. And really, with the cost of mini bars, I'm not sure how many people will miss them. And here's, here's actually a picture of um, one of our presidents um, from the U.S. eating at a famous um, place in Philadelphia which is a city in the state where I live. I live in Pennsylvania. And um, it's just an example of what we always used to do all the time, pick up food with our hands, eat it. Well, now if you're gonna do that, the recommendation is don't do it in public because you don't know what you've been touching and what's gonna go into your mouth. And so these are things to just consider. The number seven idea, long lines and noisy tight spaces have become riskier. We all know it, we feel it. Whoever liked long lines and cues anyhow, right? Standing in line for 20 minutes or more for a meal. Um, hopefully the days of judging a foodie experience from a crowd of people waiting to get inside is over. Also, um, eating outside whenever we can 
And also, if there's loud noises and people yelling and shouting, again, um, we're being told that it's not a good idea to be near someone who um, might be able to keep their, um, yes. <laughs> so solutions, right? What are some solutions? Customers are learning to make reservations, to call food orders in ahead of time, to be on time. And hosts have begun calling customers' cell phones to eliminate the need for waiting. So new practices and procedures that are eliminating, in fact, forbidding lines seem to be working. Here is an establishment in Texas that decided to, it's an establishment that had lines of people waiting for hours to get into this famous breakfast food. And now they came up with um, the idea to begin a couple food trucks so that they could roam around the city of Houston. They also opened something in um, the airport. So it's being innovative. Um, this, this diner in um, Maryland is really a delicatessen and they're very popular, but they're surviving because they've always been diversified. They have a number of businesses, a bakery, a creamery, coffees, candy businesses, and they're able to um, maintain staying open based on their diversification. So the number six, if you have to be in smaller groups, for gastro-tourism people, it's great because it's easier to personalize, right? Smaller groups equal more personalization. People still want to do foodie things. They just don't want to do them in big places like festivals and mega shows. They want private tours and classes in outside places like nature centers and maybe in bed and breakfast, right? Smart businesses have learned how they can generate revenue and profit by doing these personalized, upgraded gastronomic experiences. And this, I think, is a very important idea. Because everyone wants personalized experiences, more concierge-style ser services are creeping up, right? So people are doing private chef's tables and wine and cheese pairings and specialized tours and, and you know, very small group activities. And these guides are experts and they stay with you and they help you to have the best experience possible in a small group. Um, here's an example of a, a fishing group that used to be a very huge, large expedition, and now they do private trips, right, for a couple, a family, or a group of friends. Okay. And linkages with local universities also provide rich content experts who are very specialized and can help give you um, authentic um, educational experiences tied into food um, and beverage. And this was an interesting example of a whole country looking to provide personalized concierge assistance for people who are willing to move there for a year and create um, a, a home away from home for a whole year. And the country takes advantage of the new temporary residents in exchange for the loss of tourism. Okay. And so then the fourth over tourism is really a pendulum, right? With a, a back and a forth um, a swinging motion and both ends are really pretty bad, right? Um, you either have so many customers and you do have some money coming in from that, but they're just wrecking havoc in your town or your city. Or like we are now, we don't have over tourism. All tourism has ground to a halt and gastro places lost workers and customers and they're struggling. And so this pendulum back and forth is, is kind of difficult um, to say just where, where is the right amount of tourism. It's, it's something to ponder. Um, here's an example of Barcelona, a place that really was known for a lot of um, over-tourism, uh, and here they're looking at being local. 
And the last, pay attention to local loyals and incidental tourists, right? Pay, pay special attention to them because they're there and they will help you, right? Don't take me for granted, right? Pay attention because local loyals right now are your best hope. And then again, back to our incidental gastro tourists, they have to be in your area for some reason anyhow, so figure out ways to reach out to them. Let's do the math, right? If you generally have 35% of local loyals, 15 new locals, 20 incidentals and 30 deliberates coming to your establishment right now, it's been decimated. You might be at 35, 10, and 5. So what can you do to raise those numbers so you're back? Again, you're not going to be getting much from deliberate travelers. So you really need to look to those local loyals, try to find some new locals who will become loyals, and look at those incidental travelers. Okay, and number two, voice activated. All technology um, uh, technology across all generations is important, but voice activated technology seems to be the weapon of choice for reducing the number of surfaces and food and beverage establishments that employees touch. Examples, China is retrofitting elevators, contact less, contact less key cards and kiosks are going up overnight, voice commanded robots. Here at this um, eating establishment, everything is done um, virtually. Augmented reality and other very uh, kind of fun um, features are really available right now. We don't have to wait for them. And so then the last um, item, number one, right, people in the food and beverage industry should be consultants to the rest of the world. Okay, it's already happening. And we could also teach about gastro host guest environments and how important they are to creating welcome guests, how to recognize an authentic memorable experience through this concept of gastro communitas, where we are um, feeling at oneness with the people we gather, right? There's a relatable story, spaces that promote interaction. These are all things that the food and beverage industry can teach the rest of the world. You feel it. Okay, now we'll look at part three of the presentation where we'll, we'll look at destination development and what it requires. Okay, gastro tourism is one of the most popular and prevalent types of experiential tourism and one of the most adaptable to sustainable development. Why? Because it re requires minimal infrastructure and relies on local resources. So what does it need? Local food and beverages, knowledgeable people, and that actually was a woman I met when I was in India. I was in her house actually learning to cook had a great experience. But what doesn't it need? Well, it doesn't need extraordinary natural man-made things. All geographic areas and destinations have unique food and beverage cultures to share. So the four initial critical steps are identifying food and beverage, people experts, building a stakeholder network, and minimum infrastructure and memorability assessments. And that all begins with health and safety. My research tells us drinking water, safe food handling, crime and security are at the top of the list. What you need in planning, when you're planning to determine if something's health or safety, they want to read about it, they want to see it online, they want to see it in social media, right? And then transportation and lodging infrastructure, again, there's technology trying to help me. Okay, so um, transportation, safe, reliable, clean, right? In Costa Rica, um, a huge government investment went into transportation in infra infrastructure. It's happening this year to connect um, Costa Rican cities uh, predominantly for tourism. Um, lodging, clean, reliable, safe. 
And then communication infrastructure, of course, Wi-Fi on site, my native language, internet, cell phone coverage. So what makes a travel experience memorable? Okay, if you looked at the top of the pyramid, memorability. Um, for, for gastro tourists, that's probably the most essential. Once the basic infrastructure is there, they want these memorable experiences. And my research tells us that foodie risk taking and co-created relationships, authenticity, sociability, and emotions are all things attributed to whether something will be memorable for someone, right? Um, I'm gonna skip through these. Um, and the top authenticity considerations, <laughs> I was really surprised that my research actually said having fun was the most important consideration. And this was through many iterations of surveying people. And so we need to keep that in mind. It is about the food, but it's about an experience that's fun, enjoyable, and you learn through it, right? And it's hands-on and you get to bring recipes home and it's casual and you get to watch experienced cooks and shelves. You, you learn about new cultures and it's local and it's regional. So who affects or is affecting by local tourism? All your stakeholders. Successful gastrotourism destination development depends upon cooperation among all these stakeholders and forming this six plus cluster where there are six or more businesses that group together to bring in those deliberate and incidental gastro tourists to an area all clustered around two hours with the help of professional and civic groups community members and government municipalities is what matters right that entangled marketing um, becomes self-regulating co-promoting and it becomes difficult to copy or replicate. So in summary, the steps are food and beverage resource and expert identification, working stakeholder modeling, infrastructure memorability assessments, working stakeholder model formalized, and then economic and quality of life indicators established. And then you begin formal cluster formation, co-branded promise creation and co-marketing. So places that have done it, Wales in 2015, Peru by the year 2021 ensures that it's gonna be recognized worldwide and it already is. And here a proposed vision for India, a new gastronomic destination. I'll pause for a minute and then looking at culinary regions and busiest Indian airports. And then lastly, here I'm giving you stars on all the locations where there are Amity University locations. So if anyone's interested, if you think you are a gastro tourist, join, join the conversation and check out my website. Um, if you're interested in work regarding the 17 UN Sustainable Destination Development Goals and Gastrotourism. My researcher, my research colleagues and I are working on this, so get in touch with me. And uh, thank you. <laughs> and do we have a little bit of time for questions? Yes, ma'am, am I audible to you? Yes, I hear you. Ma'am, uh, first of all, thank you so much. It was a very engaging and a very informative uh, presentation of yours. Uh, the you. way you have described what is gastro tourism, then not only what was it like in the past, but the future, and how the food and beverage industry can actually teach the entire world about the hygiene concerns, which yes. are taking the forefront right now. So ma'am, uh, there are just a few questions I will pick up. Actually, we have a lot many questions, but since we have some time constraints, I'll just try to pick up uh, only a few of them, the best of them. Okay. So ma'am. Well, uh, and, and maybe if you have additional questions, I would be glad to correspond with you through email and answer any of them in the future. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, the first question is, how are the food and beverage festivals going to change in the post-COVID-19 scenario? Yeah. I, I do feel like my caution about long lines and not being able to um, 
be in large groups. Um, uh, my husband and I were actually scheduled to be at a wine um, conference where we speak about um, wine and gastrotourism and it was canceled and then they tried to have um, just some online visual things but the bad part about in in the food industry people really want to taste right? And so uh, unless we have these creative ways of shipping food back and forth or getting people involved in, in getting things locally, I think in the near future, at least the next year, um, there's going to be a delay in all of that. Um, I was also going to Africa um, to do a presentation. So, so I think even the festivals, even large academic conferences are being canceled. So um, I think it's the time to plan for when everything opens up. And, and I have heard some people in tourism say this is not the time to do marketing. Well, I, I disagree pretty firmly that this might be the time to do some really good um, social media kind of um, of marketing so people are aware of what your products are when you're ready to open up. Right, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, after this pandemic, uh, will the tourists become skeptical about trying out, you know, a scary or bizarre food, which was uh, pretty much in vogue earlier? Well, one of the things that my research told me is people who consider themselves gastro tourists, it's a niche of tourists, right? And we're willing to go out into the world and try interesting things, regardless of the risks. I have stories of people who um, went tarantula hunting with their driver in, in a South American country and then went home and cooked up and fried the tarantula with the driver's family and children, and then they ate that meal. So I'm telling you that story because gastrotourists, one of the memorability pieces that they associate with is this risk taking. So there will be people willing to take risks, safe, safe risks, but take risks to continue having this extraordinary experience. That's my belief. I predict that they'll still do it. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, I'll just pick up two more questions. So the third question is, uh, does gastro tourism on its own, like without blending it with any other product of tourism or any other form of tourism, does it have the potential to attract the tourists? Yes, yes, it already does. And um, I spent about five years researching the whole phenomenon just to convince myself and to have the data to back that up that yes, gastrotourism is one of the strongest um, poolers to an area. So even if a person doesn't call themselves a gastrotourist, they're still looking for this food. And People who do this spend more money, stay longer. And so when you take that multiplier effect of all of that, those conditions, um, gastro tourism destination development is probably one of the first things you should do if you're thinking about creating a tourism um, initiative in your region because it also doesn't need the Taj Mahal. It doesn't need a five-star hotel. It just needs local regional food and people who know what to do with it. And every region, and I know all the regions in India that I were, have visited, know how to do this. It's just advertising it and marketing it and branding it in a way that make people understand and make it easy to find too so uh, yes yeah. yes uh, so probably uh, i mean taking the last question someone is asking that whenever we talk about gastro destinations in the world we think about the countries like france italy which are the developed countries so in regard to this narrative how can we change the attitude among the foreign gastro tourists from developed countries when mm -hmm. it comes to india being projected as yes. a, I mean, it's a third world country. We are a third world country. So how do we project ourselves? Right. Like, uh, because we are often looked down uh, because of the poor hygiene standards and cleanliness. Yeah. 
So right. how do we change that? Well, and I think that um, here, to positively impact local Indian economies and living standards through newer expanded gastro-tourism destination development that highlights India's world-class regional cuisines and unparalleled hospitality. So you've got the food, you've got the people, right? And so what you don't have is the marketing and the advertising. And now you could do that online for a very little amount of money, but you have to do those steps that I said earlier, right? You have to, here, this, these are the steps, right? So you have to identify what you have. And most importantly, remember the six plus, right? You have to have at least six really good things, cooking class, a, a, a farm that lets you come and, and, you know, look at how food is grown, um, you know, six rich things that are within a two hour radius, advertise that co-brand together, right? So all of those groups aren't individual businesses, they become a cluster you put that cluster advertised in the sky, right? In the cloud, people will be looking for somewhere they can go for a rich experience. And they won't be thinking India, they'll be thinking Indian food, a region. They'll be thinking, um, you know, one particular place. I could go to a spice market, I could go to these things, but it's the marketing and the branding that's missing right now, not the food, not the people in the hospitality. You have that culture there. Yes, water is important, but when I went to a cooking class in India, it was very obvious that the woman teaching me was using bottled water. I felt very safe, right? She had a big bottle of water in her home. I learned wonderful cooking in her home. I never was sick a day I was in India. And so I think that putting those safety elements into your advertising is key. Thank you so I much, Mom. Professor Sidroth is agreeing because he's nodding. He's a marketing professor, right? You know. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you uh, so much, ma'am, for your insights. Now, may I request Professor Siddharth to kindly deliver the vote of ma'am. Uh, ma'am, thank you so much. Uh, in fact, the points that you are sharing really enriched us, particularly the clutter-breaking strategies and innovations are very, very critical, particularly in a country like India, which is absolutely true. Uh, the, all the points that you have shared is really enriching and add a lot of value to all the participants, including us. And you've really made it so simple and uh, so humbly you have shared it. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yeah. And we're really looking to have more sessions with you in the future. Mm -hmm. And on our behalf, really thank you for your wonderful session on behalf of Amity University. And thank I you. am sorry, I had to rush through some of them. No, um, it was perfectly fine. Was perfectly but uh, fine. I, I appreciate um, the patience and... Yeah. Um, hopefully, no, it was really, really, you know, the PPTs are really attractive, really systematic, mm -hmm. and you didn't go far. It was really, really nice, very beautiful, and rich. Thank you so well, much. Well, I look forward to it, and and I do um, offer to answer any other questions um, that that people may have, and do okay. feel free to um, share my email. Sure. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.